Good morning, and welcome to Vincent Katz's This is the Fargo Short Course. Today we have Rich Hyde. He is a professor in the Structural Biology Program at Memorial Sloan Kettering. He is interested in molecular mechanisms of intercellular ion channels. I think something that we talked about yesterday that Fred went over the math and Amade was talking about classification and how classification can be dangerous. But what Rich was able to do to good effect is tease out dynamics and mechanism from classification. And if you do that quite wisely, you can get Tesla models to really push biomedical research forward. And something I'm going to talk about today is interpretation of the limitations of a single particle. And I'll continue throughout the morning. So, Rich Hype. Oh, sorry. We just created a trip hazard for him. Uh, one click, and then it'll turn green. Now it's on. Okay, great. Thank you. So good morning. Um, as Ed said, I'm an assistant faculty at Sloan Kettering here in New York, and my lab uses electron microscopy to understand how information is moved across biological membranes. And so these tend to be dynamic molecules adopting multiple conformational states, and so we try to use some of the, the, the power of cryo-EM to sample these different states and see if we can interpret function based on these, com these different conformations. Um, and so today I'll take you through a little bit of background in the field and then one or two examples from my own work as to where we've used different tools to try to understand a specific question. And so whenever I talk to someone about cryon, whenever I teach it, whenever I think about it, I always have a couple questions that I want to, to stress to them that even if they ignore everything else I say, that they can take back one or two of these things and apply them to their own work. And if any time here you guys have questions, comments, anything, please interrupt and let me know. Uh, I'd rather spend the whole hour talking about two slides and have people understand those two slides than go through all the slides and have everyone just fall asleep. So please raise your hand, ask a question whenever you have one. But to me, the, the most important questions you have is, what is the, what is the reason why you're actually doing cryo -EM? So why did you go through all the effort of expressing, purifying, vitrifying, putting it in the microscope? And binding is. And so whenever you have a, a project start, you want to really think critically about what the question is that you're trying to address. And then as you go through and, and collect your data, you want to be able to evaluate can this data actually address that question? And so this goes to the second question, is what evidence do you have that supports the hypothesis that your structure faithfully represents the protein or complex that you wish to study? So if you're trying to get, say, a, a complex of a membrane receptor with a drug bound, you need to make sure that the, the drug is actually there. So you probably want to have some sort of orthogonal experiment showing that you have a KD sufficiently high that at the concentration of the drug that you're adding to your complex or your protein, it's actually going to bind at some reasonable occupancy in the, the protein that you're imaging. And the third question is, is the domain that you're actually interested well resolved, and this is something that you come a little bit later once you actually have your density maps, is, is the domain that you're interested in studying well resolved in some, all, or none of your maps? So say you get three different conformations, and you have one that has the ligand, and you've collected another data set without the ligand, and a third where you have a, a, a different ligand, but in the ligand bound data set, you don't actually see the domain where you think your ligand binds. That's going to change the way you can interpret and evaluate the, the density map because it, you might mean that ligand binding just causes a dislodgement of that domain from the rest of the complex, which is information, but not necessarily going to be structural information talking about the molecular interactions between your ligand and the protein or complex of interest. And then even if it is there, what resolution is it, is it visible? If you're looking at a small molecule, you're going to need pretty high resolution in order to identify how that molecule is interacting with the protein or complex of interest. And then the last thing, and for me the most interesting thing, and the reason why I've really been excited about cryo-EM uh, ever since I started as a graduate student, is can you see different conformations of that domain of interest or the protein entirely of, of interest? 
Okay, and so here's just two examples of proteins I've worked on. And so in this case, you can see the entire protein is pretty well resolved. This is a, a density map colored by local resolution. It's all blue, indicating that it's around the same resolution. Here's another structure that we worked on uh, a few years ago. And you can see that the core of the protein, so this would be the transmembrane domain, and this is the core of the, the gating machinery, is blue and white with some red around it. So these is fairly well resolved. But you can see large portions of the protein are actually entirely unresolved in the density map. And so if we're going to try to infer questions about this part of the protein, it's going to be really difficult from this density map. We would need to do additional processing or collect it in a different confirmation in order to understand how that works. Okay, so the other thing that I always find to be extremely important is even if you have a protein and you think it, it answers a question, one thing that can be really helpful is to do a functional assessment. So what sort of orthogonal approaches can you employ to demonstrate that your protein actually does what you think it's supposed to do? And so this is just an electrophysiological trace of a paper that we did a few years ago where we added different concentrations of calcium. This is a calcium-dependent channel and saw that we got larger conductance as we increased the calcium concentration. This is a well-known uh, feature of the protein. And so in our in vitro purified system, we're able to show that we're able, that the protein has the function that we thought it had, and then when we interpret our structure, we could understand how that calcium binding could influence conformation. Another approach that you can use, and sorry, the density doesn't show up very well here, but there's density for the ions in the center, is is there a, a structure of a related protein, even distantly related, and are there particular features of that of your density map that very closely align with that? And that would suggest through not necessarily an orthogonal functional approach, but through an orthogonal structural approach, maybe an NMR structure or crystal structure from a, of a smaller domain. That will tell you that the domain, at least part of it, is of the same structure as the structure you've worked on. And that gives you a little more confidence in the structure that you've determined that it faithfully represents the protein that you're trying to address. Or, and then hopefully you can use that to infer information about the question that you were whole, the whole project started to address. Any questions? Okay, so I briefly mentioned resolution. So when you think about resolution in cryo-EM, everyone always thinks about high resolution, but it's important to think about what sort of features we see at, at different resolutions. And so I took this from a review from Yorgos Skiniotis uh, a few years ago about what sorts of resolution one can expect to see in a cryo-EM map. And so traditional cryo-EM back in the, the old biology days, most of the time you were in this 10 to 30 angstrom range, but still there's a lot of proteins that are very flexible, very dynamic, and this is the range that you can end up being. And you can still infer a lot of information about that. You just have to be able to address a question or ask a question that can be addressed with information at this 10 to 30 angstrom range where you're looking at aura architecture and you can model in perhaps crystal structures of particular domains. And if you have different conformations, even at 10 to 30 angstroms, you can see how those domains move with respect to one another. And you can propose experiments that you can address through a, a, another approach. And in the end, that's all we're ever trying to do from structure. Structure is never the end-all, be-all of any project. It's a way to generate hypotheses that you can test. The specificity of those hypotheses as you get to higher and higher resolution gets easier because you know what specific residue, if you're looking at an atomic map, what residue you want to test. Whereas if you're at the 10 to 30 angstrom range, maybe you're looking at a helix. You think this helix might be involved in a protein-protein interaction in one conformation, and it might become dislodged in another. So perhaps you use alanine scanning mutagenesis along the length of this helix to see if you can modify the equilibrium between these two states if you think that that conformational change is related to the function of the protein. Then uh, if you can get a little bit better, and so 5 to 10 angstrom range, and so this is still a, a, a very good density map, particularly for a, a large complex or a, a conformationally heterogeneous complex, now you can start to fit secondary structures. So rather than just trying to guess based on overall fit where your particular domains, here now you have secondary structure. And so you should be able to do a pretty accurate job of docking in the density or model into the density map. And this can allow you to then make even more specific hypotheses. So rather than maybe a whole helix, you might be able to break it down to just a few turns of a helix. And you could modify those, those residues to see if they influence your function. And then as you get to better than four, oh, sorry, better than four angstroms, now you can start to see protein side chains. You can start to see um, perhaps some of the additional features, small molecules, other ligands that might be bound. And so here now you can make much more sophisticated hypotheses and test these in, in a more direct fashion. But in the end, you're using the same sort of information. You have a model that you've built, and you want to test that. 
to understand the particular biological question that you're interesting in, interested in addressing. But even though people always are, are pushing for high resolution, that's always the goal. It's, it makes everything easier if you have a high resolution map. Most of the structures that we solve aren't actually high resolution. So this light blue line represents those better than four inches. And this is only about 40 to 50 percent. So I went into EMDB last week, which is something I do before I give this lecture every year, and just try to get an idea of how we're doing. So a few years ago, it was maybe five to 10 percent, even at the beginning of the 2010s. That then there was very, very few. And then with the advent of direct detectors, we started to get more and more. But you could still see, even two years ago, it was only about 20% of the structures were at this better than four inch mark. Most of them were lower resolution. Now, as processing's got better, cameras gotten better, the microscopes have gotten better, our ability to make samples and, and work with the, 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 the whole process has gotten better, we can still get more. But it's still only about half the proteins actually achieve a resolution better than, than four angstroms. And so this idea that you're always going to be able to see side chains is a, a great goal, but it's not necessarily realistic. And so as you're thinking about the question that you're trying to use cryo-EM for, think about what sort of information you might be able to obtain in a 10 to 30 angstrom structure. What sort of information can you get from a 5 to 10 angstrom structure? And then if everything goes well and you get a sub-4 angstrom structure, what sort of information can you get that you wouldn't have maybe been able to obtain from these lower resolution reconstructions? And so um, here now is a trend over time. And so you can see what I was saying. And so this is the average resolution of all the structures in the EMDB deposited over time. And so up until a few years ago, 15 angstroms was the average. So if you were, got better than 15 angstroms, you were well above the average. And it, even up until 2014, it was better, worse than 10 angstroms. And only recently has the average structure crept down to even near five angstroms. So that means most likely, if you determining a structure, it's probably going to be in this range with, a, you have a good chance now of getting in this range, but you still, most of the time, yes, Tom? So what do you think, now that you have direct detectors, why doesn't everybody have Well, one example are proteins like this, where you have domains that are extremely flexible. And so even though you can align one part of the protein to, to fairly good resolution, you have mo other regions of the protein that are extremely dynamic and moving not necessarily in a concerted fashion. So when you image tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, now millions of particles of what you think are the same molecule, they're not necessarily going to be in the same conformation. So when you average them, you're going to have this disordered region that's going to influence the ability to align your ordered region. Don't you classify now? In some cases, yes. In some cases, no. There's large multi-protein complexes that even you know, people spend years classifying, and they can't separate out all of the different states. Some cases you're purifying from an endogenous source and you don't necessarily know what are the post-translational modifications, what sort of splice variants do you have, what is the composition of the complex. You know that you have a core component that you're maybe pulling down with, with an antibody, but it could have five or six or maybe a hundred different combinations of different protein components that are involved in that complex. And so even with all of the software we have, because in the end the software is noise limited, and so if you only have a, a small domain that comes on and off, you're not necessarily going to be able to find that in a big megadalton complex. And so to be able to discriminate plus or minus subunit X or plus or minus subunit Y, because these may also happen in an in, in independent manner. That's kind of the point I was trying to get to. The things that we look at these days are rarely now seeing a protein. It's got really complicated as well as a people. That's why you're still not getting to very high yeah, because if it's a, a, sing a single protein, generally those are the ones that go to high resolution. Those are ones that people can, can work with in, in a more straightforward fa manner. But the things that people are interested biologically are these large multi-protein complexes that we've known about for many years, but were structurally intractable up until the last two or three years. <laughs>
so the EMDB unfortunately doesn't have a way to track it by its molecular weight. But I know just in my own experience, proteins that we would have laughed at even trying, like you said, 200 kildaltons a few years ago, I, I, impossible. Now, sub 100 kildaltons, you can get better than three angstrom reconstructions. So it, it, it has, in some cases, to do with the shape. It has some cases to do with how well behaved it is biochemically, how much conformational heterogeneity is present, similar to what you have for larger complexes. But with the new, especially with the K3 detector, where you can get four, five, 8,000 images a day, you're not necessarily limited by, by the signal to noise because you just boost your signal by collecting more and more and more data. And that makes a, a big difference. And I'll show some examples of that later on. Any other questions? Thank you for interrupting. This is definitely more informative for me to, to see what sort of questions people have rather than just lecturing on what I thought was interesting over the last few years. Okay, so here's just a, a couple examples of cryoEM data. So this is actually a um, micro EV crystal. And here this is what sub one sub one angstrom data. And so you're actually resolving individual spheres for the atoms. Um, for a single particle, we're unlikely to, to achieve this resolution anytime soon. Doesn't mean that we won't be able to, but this is what atoms look like if you actually can get to some angstrom resolution. More reasonable is something for one of the best behaved samples. So this is aldolase. So this is a common way benchmark sample that people use. So this was a 2.6 angstrom structure. Now you can start to see some water molecules. You can see all of the side chains and a little bit of the, the backbone carbonyl bump. So this is now moving into what, if you had a perfect sample and you were really happy with it by cryoEM, this you might be able to achieve. But then still, there's a lot of samples that are around four angstroms. And so this is an example of an ion channel from a few years ago where they're able to get about a 4.1 angstrom reconstruction. And you can see that there's entire helices that are multiple conformations. And that's probably what's limiting the ability to resolve this at higher resolution. Perhaps now if they collected 10 times more data and used more powerful classification algorithms, they might be able to sort out these different states and get higher resolution for all of them rather than one mix of all these different states at a slightly lower resolution. But at some point, the question that you're trying to address limits what you're actually trying to do. If you need three angstrom information because you're trying to look at a binding site, then perhaps this would be insufficient. But if you're just trying to understand the overall fold of a protein, because it's the first time it's been seen, this might be sufficient to answer the question that you're trying to address. Okay, so resolution, what does it mean? So what are some of the common features of very high resolution reconstruction? So we talked briefly about this, but I'm going to go in a little more detail. What are some of the common limitations that degrade resolution of cryoEM reconstructions? And then at what stages of the cryoEM structure determination process can we make improvements to try to push the resolution and thus the resolvability? And so this is a, a recent EMDB deposition of a uh, GPCR and complex with the rest in. So this is a low, fairly low resolution structure. I think this is 4.5 or so. But because it's the first time anyone's been able to resolve how a GPCR interacts with an arrestin, this is a high profile paper, not necessarily high resolution, but because they have structures of all the pieces, they can start to understand how this works. And then using a lot of protein biochemistry and other tools, they could actually use this to interpret the, the interaction and do a lot of functional studies to test their hypotheses. At the other end of the spectrum, this is the highest resolution reconstruction in the EMDB. It's one of apoferritin. And I looked through the EMDB again last week, and six out of the 10 highest resolution structures are all apoferritin. And I imagine Ed probably has another 15 that he could deposit there that are around two angstroms if he wanted to, just because they use it to benchmark the microscope here as to people all over the world do on a regular basis. Because it's a nice, highly symmetrical, well-ordered molecule that allows you to resolve it with fairly small number of particles, it freezes well, and you can get a high resolution to see, yes, your microscope is behaving properly, or no, it's not behaving properly. And so most people, when they put in a new microscope, they get apoferritin, put it in, and want to see, can we get to sub-2 angstrom, sub-2.5, whatever their goal is for their particular microscope. And the reason why is because, what is the symmetry of apoferritin? Oh, symmetry. So how many? Well, like 24. So 24 copies. So each molecule that you image, you get 24 copies of it. So with just a few hundred images, you can get millions of views and hopefully get to high resolution. 
And so what are some of the other samples that can also achieve high resolution? Uh, or, or similar, so viruses and other highly symmetric molecules. Most of these large protein complexes that we've been talking about, they're unlikely to achieve this. And so some of the reasons why they're limited in resolution is that they have low or no symmetry. So in some cases, highly symmetric molecules are very interesting, but in most cases, those have been solved. People have worked extensively on highly symmetric molecules because that was traditionally what EM was useful for. Now people are looking at these large multi-component complexes that have no symmetry, and so it's very difficult to use the, the traditional high symmetry, take a few images, we get many, many views of it approach. Instead, you have to take many views of the complex and try to sort them out into their, their various states. And this is what I'm um, going to say here, is this idea of heterogeneity. So there's two types of heterogeneity. One is compositional heterogeneity. If you're purifying an endogenous complex, or even if you're purifying a complex recombinantly, you may have one subunit that's labile and only there 10 or 20% of the time. And if the larger and larger complex you have, the more and more components you have, the more likely that some of these components are going to be labile. And so if you have some of these 30, 40, 60, 60 component complexes, and you have all of the different possible combinations of components coming on and off, it may be almost impossible to have a uniform sample where everything is, is there in one state, but you collect many, many states and try, try to work that out. The other type is conformational heterogeneity. And so this refers to, even if you have the same number of components, even if you maybe even just have one component, but that component adopts many different conformational states, the traditional averaging approaches aren't going to work, and you need to classify these out and try to identify different substates that represent different populations of your particles within the data set. Um, and reasons that even, not necessarily even to do with the biology, is in some cases you have weak interactions. Under physiological conditions, you may have extra chaperones or extra components that when you purify these from in vitro um, proteins, you're not necessarily going to have those around. The other thing is just the freezing condition itself, the vitrification, is really harsh. Often you can start with a beautiful protein, you can run it over gel filtration, you can put it in a negative stain, you can see every component there, you vitrify it, and all of a sudden all you see are little specks everywhere because you've sheared it apart. People are starting to develop new approaches, um, such as spotted on here at NYSBC, SMC, to try to identify better ways to vitrify samples. Because for most of us, we're still using the same approach that Jacques Dubassé developed now almost 40 years ago of pipe out a little on the solution, add some filter vapor, and slam it down into liquid ethane and hope that it, everything survives. But the air, inner water, the air water interface is a very harsh environment. And even if your protein doesn't necessarily get pulled apart, if your protein has an affinity for the air water interface, you're often going to get a very preferred orientation distribution. So you may only be looking at one view of your protein, which will limit your ability to, to resolve the structure. And this is what I'm talking about here. In other cases, you have um, it sticks to the carbon. And so then you also have issues with the orientation because you don't have very many particles left in the hole. And the, there's many, many approaches. Um, People use detergents, people use uh, thin carbon layers, people use graphene layers, and there's a new paper about every other week about a new way that you can overcome one or every one of these problems, depending on how ambitious a particular method paper is to try to overcome this. Because everyone starts with a particular, let's just freeze it, put it in the microscope and see, and only when you look at it do you identify the particular problems, and then you can go through the literature and try any of a number of vitrification or sample preparation approaches to try to improve your sample that may overcome your particular protein. But in this case, it's still empirical. It's more like a traditional crystallography screen. You've got a hit. Let's just brute force through as many things as possible, and maybe we'll find one that works better. But with EM, you, we don't have this nice high throughput approach where you can screen through 100 grids in an hour at the synchrotron. So it's a little bit harder to know what works. And so as soon as you get one that works, you generally stay with it. You don't try the, all the other perturbations that you would plan to test. OK, so some of the ways that, that we've used is just brute force data collection, millions of particles. And so this is an example of a, a sub-100 kilodalton complex that we work on, where at, with fewer than 1,000 particles, we can get about 4.7, 4.6 sanction structure. But as we start moving up into the hundreds of thousands of particles, now we start to get closer to three angstroms. And you can see that we're still in the linear portion. So if we needed to get to higher resolution, perhaps we could collect another several million particles, and we might be able to push it beyond three angstroms. And so 
I know there's a couple pieces of software that can do this where you just give it your whole data set after classification and it will plot out resolution as a function of particle. What you can see though is this is a logarithmic scale and so it's easy to make these first few jumps where you're moving from say four to three and a half actions, but now you can see there's a significant change in slope and so to go from a hunt from a thousand to ten thousand particles is relatively straightforward. From ten thousand to hundred thousand is now getting relatively straightforward. But going from a hundred thousand to a million, from a million to ten million, this is where you start to really run into the hardware limitation and protect, and in some cases sample limitation. If you can't necessarily make boatloads of your protein because you're purifying purifying it from a native source, or it's endogenous, or it's very fragile. Yes. What's the number of particles you started with? That's the final reconstruction. So after classifying out 90% of the protein, this is what we have left, is this two or 300,000. So we already started with several million particles. And so in order to achieve that next jump, we might need to collect 10 times more data, which at that point, it becomes unfeasible because this was already several days of data collection. So to collect another 10 million particles would be more than what we would have access to just hardware-wise. So you go with just one grid, or are you merging? So this was several data sets of several grids to get this. And we did a, a similar analysis with the data sets from A and B grid, and it's the same sort of trajectory, and so that's why we merged them together. So I have a problem. Why would it need so many particles? Is this because it's small and it's got the very bad signals in this version? That that's our hypothesis, is that a lot of the view a lot of the protein, we know it's a, it looks on if there's nothing else after the purification, you look at it in the images, you only see one thing, it's a micelle with a, a, a channel on the inside. But for whatever reason, we've tried every piece of software available, and a certain number of particles that they just can't deal with. You can give it a, a reference, and it doesn't align. You can do 2D classification, and they look OK, but they look fuzzy. They don't look like they're high resolution. Perhaps they've been damaged. Perhaps they're another confirmation that we just aren't able to, to handle. The software isn't able to resolve. And so as software gets better, perhaps these sort of, of limitations will go away. But in, in many cases, with small proteins or with heterogeneous complexes, you start with a, a very large data set, and in the end, you only have a small fraction. And for someone who's trying to understand function, that can be really, really a difficult idea that we're trying to understand the population, but we're only able to actually determine a structure of maybe 5 or 10% of it. So what do those other 90% represent? And with larger complexes, it, it can be sometimes easier because you have fewer particles that get discarded during the classification approach. But with small proteins, this is still a limitation of both the hardware and software that they are the protein because that's the only thing present on the grid, yet a vast majority of them aren't able to go into the structure. So we don't know what state they're in, which makes it hard to understand what is the effect of, say, adding a ligand if we're already throwing away 90% of the particles because that might be some small subpopulation that the ligand affects either differently or it doesn't even bind to. Other thing that you can do is use structure determined chaperone structure determination chaperones. And so these are things such as antibodies or nanobodies that you can raise that are specific for your protein or complex of interest. So say you have a labile inter interaction domain. If you can find a nanobody that binds to it, this might stable, particularly if it binds both components, this might stabilize that interaction. So rather than having an entire movement, it may limit it to only five degrees and then that's something you might be able to deal with. The other thing is for small proteins, these antibodies or nanobodies increase the molecular weight, help with alignment, and so this might allow you to go from lower resolution to higher resolution just because you're now working with something that's effectively a larger complex, and so you have more electrons to align with your images. Um, another thing is to identify small molecules. If you have a very dynamic complex and you know that you have a fairly flat energy landscape of many, many states, but you know that there's small molecules that'll bias it to state A or state B or state C. If you start with your population of all of the states at low resolution, and then you add your small molecules to get higher resolution of each one of those states, that might be able to help you understand not only why you have a flat energy landscape in an APO state, but how these individual ligands influence the energy landscape, shifting the equilibrium in one direction or another. Similar to, to protein cofactors, in some cases, a complex needs another accessory protein in order to have a, a more stable confirmation. So your first pull down, you may only identify six components, but then if you go back and change your buffer conditions and identify a seventh condition, a seventh protein, that might actually stabilize your complex a little bit for reasons that aren't necessarily known initially. 
And then the last thing, and something that, that I try to avoid, but in some cases there's no way around, is to use molecular biology to modify our constructs. In some cases you have really long disordered linkers at N or C terminer or in the internal part of the protein. And there's no way to overcome these, and these can induce heterogeneity, they can cause aggregation, and so you might need to, to trim these back. For crystallography, this was traditional practice. For EM, we know that modifying N and C termini modifies the protein function, and so if we don't have to cut them off, I would recommend not doing it, but in some cases there's no way around it to get the reconstruction that you need, or even to get a well-behaved protein biochemically, so you may need to do a lot of modifications of the construct to get to that step. Yes? Uh, do you recommend cross-linking your sample? So I, I recommend trying everything until you get something that works, but one of the issues with cross-linking, similar to modifying the construct, is you're changing the molecular interactions. You're biasing it towards some small subset where the two residues that are part of that cross-link are close together. So say you have a domain that's doing this, and you add a cross-link, you're only going to capture this state. That might allow you to determine the structure, but then I would recommend going back and collecting a structure, even if it's much lower resolution, in the absence of the cross-linker, so that you can recognize that this isn't the only state. You might also have this and this and this in between, and that might be important for understanding the function of your protein. So cross-linking is a very powerful tool, but just like any of these, you need to understand what is the effect of that tool on the equilibrium of your proteins. And so this is what I was talking about, brute force. When the K2 detectors first came out, 400 images a day, you were doing okay. A few years ago, it was about 2,000. Now, we routinely get somewhere between six and 7,000 K3 images a day, and so these are about 50% larger than K2 images. So you can really brute force samples in a way that wasn't even feasible a few years ago, just because the hardware has gotten so much faster. And so this is still the same Creo, same one microscope, but now we're getting over an order of magnitude more data from that same instrument. And so what was feasible a few years ago in some case, or not feasible a few years ago, is feasible now in some cases just because you can collect more data. Also yes, computation can handle this. Six years ago, you couldn't have handled this many particles. The classification software was working, but it would just take years to run through 3D classification of 10 million particles. Now with CryoSpark, you can split it in smaller batches and get it done. You set it up before you go to bed and it's ready to go in the morning when you wake up. So the, the software has kept up with the advances in the hardware. So um, here's talk a little bit about heterogeneity and sample preparation. So as we talked about, there's this idea of composition, compositional heterogeneity and structural heterogeneity. And so this is going back to 2014, but to me this is one of the most important papers in the field. So it was the first structure of the mitochondrial ribosome. And the reason why it was so important, at least in my evaluation of the field and understanding of the way that the field was going, is that it was not possible to purify a mitochondrial ribosome. No matter what you did, you always had some cytosolic ribosomes that would co-purify. And so for crystallography, that made it not possible. It was just too dirty. For EM, Prior to this, the idea that you could have an entirely different protein at a high abundance in your sample and determine a structure was also outside of what I thought the realm of possibility was. But in this work by Becky Ramakrishnan and Short Sheras, they demonstrated that using 3D classification, they could first this slide here, they could first sort out all of the cytosolic ribosomes and then just get the right. So first they were able to get the compositional heterogeneity, get rid of all of the things that were not um, the mitochondrial ribosomes. Then they did a second round of classification because they had a mixture of large subunit, small subunit, and just large subunit. And they wanted to sort those out to focus just on the large subunit to try to determine the structure of that. And so there they're able to use conformational and compositional heterogeneity by classifying with the use of masks and actually sort out different states. Um, here's what we were talking about cross-linking. So we already mentioned most of these things. Domain deletions can reduce uh, heterogeneity, modifying the um, buffer conditions, in some cases pH, salt, glycerol, similar to the, idea, the sorts of screens that crystallographers have been using over the last several decades, that different buffer conditions stabilize different types of interactions, and different interactions might be the ones that are actually important for your complex to maintain its structural uh, integrity. 
no, here's the slide, I got switched around. So this is where they started out with an initial model of a ribosome. And then they first were able to sort out the cytosolic ribosomes and what they call bad particles. With a, a ribosome, pretty much everything you pick is probably going to be a ribosome. They're huge. It's not like a 100 kilodalton channel where you might have an empty micelle or an empty nanodisc or any of a number of contaminating things that are around the same size and shape. Ribosomes are so large that it's pretty easy to pick them out from everything else. Then they wanted to sort out, of these mitochondrial ribosomes, let's focus just on the um, 54S subunit. Let's ignore density for the small subunit. And so they did a focus classification using a mask. And they were able to identify a, a population. So starting out with 100,000 particles, which at the time was a massive effort to get that many particles for something as big as a ribosome. And then the processing for this took weeks and weeks to do. But in the end, they were able to identify a population that was a pure population of just large subunit of the mitochondrial ribosome and determine its structure for the first time, demonstrating the real power of the software to sort out both conformational and compositional heterogeneity with just using software, not having to do protein biochemistry. And this really changed the way that I, and I know a lot of other people in the field, thought about EM because you could do the best you can with protein biochemistry, but some proteins are just flexible. And you still want to be able to assess their, their structures. And so the way to do that was using all of these various tools. So yep. So this is empirical. It depends on how much data you have. If you have millions of particles, which is now a, a more achievable uh, result, you may need to, rather than do it once, you might do it several times. You start with four classes, six classes, eight classes, and maybe not with the whole data set, but with a subset of the data set, because it'll go faster. Pick 100 or 200 or 500,000 particles and try multiple different classification schemes and see which gives you the best looking results. And then you can redo it on your bigger data set because software limitations are a real thing with large data sets, particularly with large complexes. You, don't necess you can't necessarily try everything, but if you try a subset of your data, you can try a lot more things to find out what works. We usually try between four and 10. Why four works better in some cases than 10 in other cases, I, I, I don't know necessarily. If you have a very heterogeneous sample, the more classes will generally work better, but we also usually use a hierarchical approach. So similar to here, where they did one round of classification followed by another, this was 2014. It was absolutely the state of the art. Here's a paper from 2016 where you can see it's now gotten much more sophisticated. And so this is a, a spliceosomal complex where they started out with an initial model and about a half million particles. So you can see here they've already increased the number of particles by five. Now, after just 2D classification, they're back down to about 140,000. And then they start through multiple types of classification, both global classification, mass classification, to try to identify different regions of the protein. Because they knew that in no place was this complex particularly well ordered, but different regions of it seemed to be large enough that they could. Yes? Um, how do I judge the quality of my classes? Do I just look at them, and if I think they look good, I then decide whether they're going to look at them and tell me that it's a good class, or I should not? So in this case, let me give a, a couple of examples. So here they have. 3%, 25%, 25%, 35%, and 3%. So a class that's only 3%, unless it's a particular conformation that looks ev unlike everything else, is might be noise, it might be signal. It's hard to know without knowing your data well. So what I, we do is we take every class at the end of the classification and do a subsequent classification of refinement to see what that means. We usually do a quick 2D classification because particularly if we think we have a noise population and a, and a real particle population, if, and you have six classes, it can be hard, particularly with a very heterogeneous data set, the first iterations, whether this is your real class or maybe this one is. And so with 2D classification, you can very quickly see now, well, maybe this is just one view. This is a preferred view, just top views. And we know that that's probably not a good class that's ever going to be useful. Where this other one that's a little bit lower resolution, the reason why it's lower resolution is because it has all different views. Whereas this other one may say five angstroms if you look at the, the, the FSC value, but it's really just one view over and over and over again. And that's why it goes very high resolution. Whereas your other one that has many different views might not be as high resolution, but that's actually the, the, the population that you want to keep working with. And so 
mixture of looking at it by eye, further classification, and a little bit of intuition. If you've already determined a structure of the protein previously, or at least a domain, you might be able to say, okay, that looks right over here. This, even though it, the features say they're higher resolution, just look weird, nothing that makes any sense to me. Let's put this on hold and we'll follow this, and maybe we can come back to this weird class later. Perhaps we've done something, we've changed the confirmation entirely, and that's actually the most interesting one, but let's first follow one that we can follow a little bit more clearly because we have some prior information about. Since you mentioned using subsets of data, um, do you have a rule of thumb about what is a good subset? Like a so we usually try to stay around a million to a million and a half or lower for a subset just because the larger you get, the slower things are. And because all of these processes are parallelizable, you can do 10 copies of a million particles a lot faster than one copy of a million particles. So I just want to comment to another question. I think that was one of the most difficult things, even for me that don't have EM for 20 years. Still, if I do three classifications, six different classes, I have no clue what is a good class, what is a bad class. And so what you do is sometimes can help you, but I think in the end, if you just reprocess, 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 eventually you get the key name for what the process actually is. Yeah. But at the beginning, I think for all of us, it's very difficult to figure out what is a good class and what is a bad class. Especially for very happy users. Yeah, large complexes where you may have entirely different mixtures of proteins from complex A to complex B. One round of classification, it may just not even be able to sort those out. You might have to go through many, many rounds to get to something that is actually interpretable because you have a mixture of both of those and so as you threshold up and down in your density map, you have whole pieces disappear that you think, okay, this isn't any good, but it's actually because you have a mixture of complex A and complex B and you do a few rounds of classification, you can actually sort those out and the one you thought was junk actually turns out to be the most important states that you have in your data set. Any other questions? Okay, so moving beyond this, so this idea of this hierarchical and cl focused classification, so now to 2018, Reliant developed an even more sophisticated approach, what they call multibody refinement. And so in this case, you have, say, three domains, what they call M, R, and C. <laughs> and you know they all move somewhat independently, what you can do is put a mask around M, subtract all the density for R and C, and do a reconstruction of just R and C. You can subtract R, do a reconstruction of just R. Subtract R and C, M, R, M and R, and do a reconstruction of just C, and then you can fit these all back together knowing that there might be flexible interfaces between them. And so if you know the boundaries of where your conformational heterogeneity is, so say you have a flexible top, but a rigid core, you could put a, one mask around the core, one mask around the top, and then perhaps there's a peripheral domain that is not as well ordered as that flexible core, but not as flexible as this. You might put a third mask there and do this multi-body refinement as an approach. And so this can work extremely well for large complexes where you have different types of movements of different domains of your complex, because you can focus in, refine one complex, or one portion of the complex, zoom back out, fit it with the other ones, and then zoom in and out of different movements. And then another thing that they do that's very nice is they make movies where you can actually see, say, you want to understand, is this rocking up here on the top related to the smaller movement of something else? Are these coupled or are these uncoupled? And so you can generate a, movement, a movie where you see the movement of this domain. Is it at all correlated with the movement of the other domain? In some cases it is, and that might suggest function. In other cases, they're uncorrelated, and so you need to do further studies. Yes? So we've had success with things that are over about 200 kilodaltons, but I know there's no, there's no technical reason it can't work for smaller ones, but the smaller the complexes are, the harder it is to get the masks at just the right point. With big complexes, you can often see where that flexible interface is pretty easily. So how is this different from particle subtraction job that you line on? So this, is, th this does it as a, a, a multi-routine. So you can do particle subtraction as a separate routine where you say, I'm only interested in this domain, let's get rid of everything else. Here, you want to be interested in this domain, but you also want to be interested in this domain, you also want to be interested in this domain. Sorry about the microphone. And so, by, rather than just doing one particle subtraction, here you can see that there's actually three particle subtraction jobs. So you first delete R and C, then you delete M and R, and the last one, you del del and the last one would be M and C. 
So you have three separate particle subtraction jobs for the three different regions of your particle that you're interested in evaluating. And in experience, do you feel like this gives better results compared to subtraction jobs? Or? In some cases it works better, in some cases it doesn't. It really depends on how well you can identify the interfaces for those masks. The advantage of just a standalone subtraction job is you can try five different masks and see what the effects are. Here you get one mask and it runs all the way through and then you get to the end and see. And because you're doing both at a time, it just takes longer. Whereas if you know that there's one domain you're really interested in, that's maybe the ligand binding pocket, you can try four or five masks to really get the best possible map of that binding pocket. Yes? So in the end, you have to record three different uh, maps or one composite map? I don't know what, that would be something to ask Kathy later. I don't know what, because EM has always been a little bit fast and loose with reporting and validation. So I don't know what the current standard is. It, in my mind, deposit everything, report everything, let everyone in the field have that information. But some people, just because it's somewhat, still somewhat of a cumbersome process to deposit 32 maps at once, they do a composite map and then that's it. But in, in my mind, make everything available, make everything available to the field particularly because someone may not be, you may be interested in the ligand binding pocket, but someone else in say California is, has a new allosteric regulator that binds to an entirely different interface, and they may not be as interested in your composite map focusing here. They may be interested in something way over there, and so giving them access to a focused refined map of just that portion may help the community in a way that you couldn't have foreseen previously. Tom? So for the, so for this dynamic complex, because we could do focus refinement and actually get reasonable maps of this part, I think we ended up doing, for this paper, somewhere around 20 different maps we deposited. Focus maps, full maps, composite maps. And it, I, I think that it's worth it to the community if you're gonna go through all this effort to do these structures you don't, you don't have to deposit them all. You can just say that people can ask you, but it's much easier to just put them in the EMDB. Once you've done five, another 10 isn't that much more work. Because it's the same. All the fields are populated the same. You just have to keep depositing the map and figure out the threshold. The problem is that I think one or two of these, somewhere during the deposition got switched, and so not all the states are quite right. And that's the issue is because it's not a straightforward system. And so this might be something to ask Kathy later, is how they're working to improve not, not you. No, no, no. It's a very difficult composite Right, but to, they, to so many groups. they should be able to make it easier for us. That, that's what I'm... Like the, the current version is much easier than the iteration five years ago. Okay. The, before, five, five years ago, it would take a day per map. And so if you had five maps, that was a week's worth of sitting and waiting for the system to process. Just uploading a map took an hour. Now you can do 10 in a day, but there's still... It, in some cases it will stall and you don't understand or there's, there's issues. So these are things to ask um, Kathy Lawson later because that's what she does is she's developing these interfaces and so if you have feedback in these sorts of ways, let her know. Yes, Tom? So I admire you. I will admire you. Because you deposit the map that you actually use with the public publication and you make upon request your data available to anybody who wants, but going to the trouble to deposit every single so you have two people here and two different opinions, so <laughs> this is where you evaluate your data and you think what is most useful to you and what do you think would be most useful to the community. And I don't, like I said, there's no hard rule as to what you have to do. I think anything that you show in the manuscript you should deposit the um, map and coordinates for. But in some cases the things along the way can be as useful for understanding as not, but it, it's really up to you. Ten minutes. Okay, thanks. Okay, so here, let's see if this movie works. So here's an example of multi-body refinement movies. So you can see there's a rotation of this domain and a rotation of this domain, and they work in a concerted fashion. They're not independent, which gives you an idea to propose how a mechanism might be because you have this concerted movement of these two domains. You have a rocking and then a twisting of, a, of an adjacent domain. 
that might influence the way that the protein works, and you can design experiments to test that hypothesis. And so here is a, another example. So this is what Krauss. Do you want to say anything about this? These movies, do they really represent what's going on? No, they don't. But they can generate hypotheses that you can test. And I think that no matter what you're doing in structure, that's got to be your take home message is that the structure isn't an absolute answer about anything. It's a way to see where things might be in some population of your protein under some condition that you can then test in either an in vitro system, an in vivo system, make a, make a mouse if you really want to test, knock, make a particular knock in of your protein under some condition, put it in a mouse and see if the phenotype is similar to maybe a disease that's been identified in humans. But no matter what you're doing with structure, whether it's these sorts of movies, whether it's eigenvectors, they're all ways to be able to better understand your data to make better hypotheses. So here's a, another approach that is done by CryoSpark. So rather than generating specific masks over different regions of the protein that you think might be flexible, this uses a, a similar approach of using eigenvector analysis. But here it just takes all of the images of all of the particles and tries to identify on its own where your different degrees of freedom are. And so in this case, you can see there's a, a rocking up here and then an expansion and a contraction down here. And because this is a small protein, with masks, we never could have identified where to put this. So the multi-body analysis would have been really hard. And because these two states, one of them is about 85% and the other one's only about 15%, with traditional classification, we could never sort these out ab initio. But once we had the two states, we could then use a seeded classification with the open and closed and continue on with the classification that way and actually get nice reconstructions of both states. And so there's many different ways that you can evaluate compositional and conformational heterogeneity with cryo-EM data. So here's now the same movie looking down the board. And you can see an expansion and contraction of the ion conduction pathway. And again, as Tom said, these movies don't, we know that the two end states are there. Whether or not the intermediate states actually exist, based on our classification, we saw no evidence of those. That doesn't necessarily mean they're not there, we just don't have evidence of them. We have evidence of state A and state B. There, you would have to infer that there has to be some sort of trajectory between those, but our data doesn't actually show those. In some cases, if you have a fairly flat energy landscape, people have been able to show a whole ensemble of actual structures from state A to state B. In this case, we were only able to report state A and state B, and so we don't know necessarily what the trajectory is it takes to get there. Yes? Has anyone uh, published an So I don't know necessarily about dimers and tetramers, but I think some of the best examples are the bacterial secretion systems, where they can have, in some cases, a 10 or 11 or 12, and it's just one subunit, so a very small change in, in the conformation, and they've been able to pull those out. Because they're so large, sizing column isn't going to necessarily discriminate between an octamer, a nonamer, and a decamer. They're all going to run about the same size. but the ring can expand or contract just slightly. It's only a few degrees to pop in or out one subunit. Um, for things that are more dynamic, that have you know a, a discrete dimer, a discrete tetramer, um, there's no reason why you wouldn't be able to do it by EM. I just can't think offhand of any specific examples where they've done that. It, of course, because you know that you're going to, rather than having state A and state B, and you can just you can sort them into two discrete bins. You have a non-discrete sampling of a continuum, and you for structures you're going to want to say 
8 8.1, 8.2, 8.3, 8.4, 8.5, 8.6, 8.7, all the way to B. And the more particles you have, the more finely you can sample that continuum, so the better result the features will be, knowing that there probably are local minima, but the, the difference between A1.1 and A1.2 might be so small structurally that our classification algorithm can't actually find where the discrete local minima are. Because if you think about an energy landscape between two states, it's never going to be perfectly flat. There's going to be local maxima and minima, and our structure should represent mostly those local minima. But classification, if it's only half an angstrom difference between those two local minima, is might not be possible to sort them out. Great. Okay, so last thing I had, I only have, I think, uh, two more slides. Great. Is what is the benefit of this type of thing? So you just gave one example where you know that you have a continuum and you want to try to sample the continuum. Say maybe you have the whole reaction coordinate of maybe an ATP ACE where you have first the full ATP and then you have a transition state and then you have ADP plus inorganic phosphate. In my case, I worked on a, a potassium channel that was activated by sodium. And so what we did was we collected cryonium data sets at different concentrations of sodium and looked at what is the distribution of particles in different states as a function of the ligand concentration. So what we did was because we knew that the signal to noise would be pretty bad for the activated state, it wasn't very abundant in low sodium concentrations, we actually pooled four data sets together, so 20 millimolar, 40 millimolar, 80 millimolar, 160 millimolar sodium, and did one round of classification of all of those, and then we repeated that same exact classification five times to find the robustness of the algorithm. And we found that one class represented what we think is an open state, and nine classes that represented a closed state. And because we could then go back and identify what fraction of the, or what particles of these came from each of the states, we could actually do a dose response curve of the fraction of particles adopting either state as a function of ligand. And then we also did a 300 millimolar state separately because it was collected on a different microscope and merging approaches were still a little bit more complicated back then. And then we did the same sort of experiment electrophysiologically. electrophysiologically. So at low sodium, intermediate sodium, and high sodium, we started to get this titration towards higher and higher fraction of particles in the activated state. And the fits of these two are actually very similar. The max open state is a little bit higher by cryoEM than by electrophysiology, but the half activation state and the Hill coefficient of four for both of them, this is a tetrameric ion channel, so it suggests that you have to bind to all four subunits at once in order to generate the conformational change. And so this was a, an example where the function and the, the structures matched up perfectly. The issue is we don't know necessarily when you take a protein out of a cellular environment. In this case, it's a detergent micelle, not a, a lipid membrane. We have not necessarily the same gradient across the, the membrane. And so there's a lot of things that can bias that equilibrium, and we don't necessarily know the mathematics of all of those different steps. But the idea that you can actually recapitulate via structure the function that you're trying to understand is an important part of what we're trying to do with cryoEM. And with that, I'd like to thank you all. And I'll take any more questions, and then we'll be able to listen to Tom. We'll take a five-minute break as we switch over speakers. And if you have any additional questions during that time, go to Richard directly. Thank you. Yep.